and do a fairly tight combat turn. Looking up now, trying to get a good view of where I am. There's the tower I want to head towards. Oh, and as we come out, I had slip, sideways slip to the right, and I really felt it. <laughs> and I'm probably shouting. I should stop shouting. Hello YouTube, this is Frugal, and this, I'm using my really crappy webcam, because I'm all set up to show you something that's been actually very tricky to set up, um, but a number of you have been asking for, and that is Oculus Rift. Here it is. This is the Oculus Rift DK2, the development kit version. Now last week, we'll go into this in a minute, I'll bring this back up and show you all the gubbins in a second, but last week Oculus announced that the Rift was available for pre-order. They had announced it was going to release at about $300. It actually released at $600, and I understand in Europe it's actually considerably more than that. Oops. Um, so the question has become, or the question that's been posed to me a number of times is, is it any good? Is it worth it? Should I get it? Should I even consider getting it? That's question number one. Question number two from those who have no idea even what Oculus Rift are, and there are quite a few of you, is what is Oculus Rift? What exactly does it do? More to the point, this whole virtual reality fad thing, would it be better to just spend the money and get three large monitors? Could you get the same effect? out of three large monitors? The answer to that is a resounding no, and I'll show you why in a second. Um, now, I haven't got HTC Vive. That's the competitor on the PC. Oculus Rift is going to be the first one to actually commercially launch, and then HTC Vive is coming out, basically Steam VR and a few extra other gubbins, and it's supposed to be better than Oculus Rift, but all I know is Oculus Rift, so I'm going to show you that. Now, DK2, the version I have, is development kit, so it's a prototype. It wasn't as good quality as the one that is going to launch in about two months' time. It's not as high resolution as the one that launches in two months' time. It's a little big, a little clunky. Um, it's quite heavy, I think, compared to the one that's going to launch in about two months' time. So, you know, bear all those things in mind. But the basic technology, the basic hardware and uh, makeup of the whole thing is going to remain exactly the same. You know, it's the same principle of strapping a large screen onto your face about half an inch away from your eyeballs, and away you go. Anyway, let me show you what it is. So this is the canonical Oculus Rift or VR headset. They all look pretty much the same now. I think Gear VR, which is Oculus as well, did a pretty good job of making things look a little bit sexy. Sony did things very differently and Sonified it all with the Project Morpheus set that's coming out for PlayStation. But this is the canonical example of what a VR headset looks like. Number of points to note, there are a number of sensors or reflectors or whatever you want to call them. If you watch motion capture behind the scenes stuff on movies, you'll have seen these little dots before. They're used to track the position of the headset. There is a large, um, almost like a track IR transmitter attached to the top of my monitor. And I understand with the release one that comes out in March that it, it actually goes on your desk. It doesn't attach to your monitor. And that as well is higher resolution. This That tracks the position of this in six degrees, which we'll get onto why that's important in a second. Um, you have three straps. Well, two straps. There's a strap that goes around the side. There's a strap that goes over the top of your head. They're all adjustable. They're also adjustable, I understand, on the release version. The release version also has integrated um, headphones that you can take off and replace with your own headphones. So if, if you want the built-in sound function of Oculus Rift, you can do that. Inside the device, there is a very soft, smooth sponge uh, layer here, which goes on your face. And you will see two lenses inside. I'm actually running a game right now. You probably can't see it very well, but there is actually something running inside there right now, this second. In fact, what are, what are we actually watching? No, it's actually just reflecting the, the uh, notebook that I'm recording on. But there are two lenses. And then behind those two lenses, so really about here, there's basically a cell phone. It's just, it's basically a cell phone screen. It's a long screen that goes completely behind here. If you're a Samsung Gear VR fan, you already know that you buy the headset and then you get your Samsung phone and strap it on the front and away you go. There is a, a phone screen behind here. In the release version, the resolution of that is 2160 by 1200, which is basically more than 1080p per eyeball because that screen is split down the middle. Each lens looks at only half the screen, those two lenses there. They each look at half of the screen, so you have the left half of the screen for your left eye, the right half of the screen for your right eye, 
that gives you a 3D effect because both images are slightly offset from one another to give you a stereoscopic effect. So when you put this on, things very much, very, very, very much are 3D. Imagine the coolest 3D movie experience you've ever had and then multiply it by a thousand. That would be what it's like to strap on one of these things in a well-developed title, be it a simulation, video game, or whatever else. There are a couple of screws on the side of this. I understand they are also going to be there in the release version. And what they do is they move the lenses further away from your eyeballs and closer to your eyeballs. And you do that to calibrate each lens for each eyeball so you get a nice picture. It is actually quite hard setting this up to get a nice non-blurred, non-doubled image. Um, you do need to spend a little bit of time calibrating, with DK2 at least, calibrating those lenses and getting them the right distance from your eyeballs. And even then, when it goes on your face, you will find yourself minutely adjusting it up and down to reduce blurring. If you have it slightly off center it, it, in DK2, it tended to blur some of the text. So you, you pull it down, lift it up, wiggle it around a bit until everything comes into focus. Now, the six degrees of freedom thing. That's a key feature of any VR headset is the ability to track the headset's position in 3D space. Now think of it like Track IR. Track IR gives you six degrees of freedom in a cockpit. So you strap this infrared emitter to the side of your head. You have an infrared receiver on top of your monitor and it tracks what's going on. So as you lean in, it picks up that you're leaning in and it will zoom the view. If you move back, it will unzoom the view. And it also track you leaning side to side, moving up and down, and of course, tilting your head and rotating your head. That's what Track IR does. The problem with any um, IR tracking device like Track IR is that if I want to look sideways, so I'm flying my sim now, looking at my monitor. If I want to look sideways, so I want to look to the right, I have to do that. And you'll notice that as soon as I do that, I'm kind of looking at the side of my eyeball, and this eye really doesn't have very much to do at all. It's, it's desperately trying not to look at that monitor, desperately trying not to look at the wall and the surroundings, and man, I really need to get up there and dust. It's trying not to notice all that stuff. It's trying to pay attention to what the left eye is doing, which is already kind of straining sideways to keep an eye on the actual monitor, even though I've turned my head to the side. Same if you do that common problem that I have in things like DCS where uh, doing a cold and dark start in an A10, looking down is really hard. So if you're trying to look down at panels beside you as a pilot and flick switches, you kind of trying to look upwards at the monitor and it just doesn't work very well. What I end up doing in titles like that is I'll actually look up, I'll calibrate the center of track IR, look normal, you know, look straight at the screen, and that resets the view in the sim to downwards and then I can quite happily move across all the switches. It is not an optimal solution. This is. This absolutely is. Let me explain what happens when you put this on first of all. When you actually put this on your face, those two lenses are very, very close to your eyeballs. Now, I'm not sure of the health implications of that. I did actually worry when I first got them about, is this damaging my eyes? Maybe, I don't know. I don't think anybody's done any studies yet. But anyway, you have those two lenses very, very close to your eyes. Close enough, in fact, that all you can see out of your peripheral vision and your straight ahead vision is the environment that you're in. So if you're in a simulator or in a spaceship, all you see is the cockpit. Now, because this tracks my head position in six degrees, I can look around. I can actually look up. And as I look up, there's no scaling like there is in Track IR, where if I move my head that much, it will flip the view 30 degrees, 40 degrees. In Oculus Rift or any VR headset, if I do that, then I'm actually looking up there in the cockpit. And because all I can see is cockpit, my view will change and follow my head. So I'm now looking up and to the right in the cockpit. It gets better than that, as you'll see when I demo this in a second. It gets actually way better than that. Um, to the point that in a well-developed title, because the sensors are tracking the position of this um, with far more granularity and uh, precision than something like Track IR, you can actually get up, stand up, and walk around. In fact, let's get onto software for a second before we go into a demo. Older versions of this, the, the SDK, the software development kit that powers this, that gamers would need to interface with, there was version 0 0.5, which was pretty good, 0 0.6, which was better, and 7, and then along came, well, along came 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. With the earlier versions, 5 and 6 in particular, you had two modes of this working. You had direct mode and extended mode. In extended mode, the screen 
your PC screen would be mirrored. It would be, it would basically turn, it would start that again. In extended mode, this would be treated like a second monitor, okay? So when you ran up a game or a sim, you would tell it, I'm using the Oculus Rift monitor, and instead of rendering everything on your main monitor, it would start rendering in here, of course, drawing two different offset images, one for each eyeball. And that's how extended worked. Um, with direct mode, it doesn't do that. With direct mode, it actually treats this as a unique device, not a monitor, and it outputs a signal to this, which is specific to this, and supposed to be more optimal, supposed to be faster, and that's what we got in 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and soon 1.0. Now, 0 0.8, also brought with it, or it kind of came with, Steam VR support. Steam VR is a, a beta that you can opt into on Steam, which is the virtual reality environment for Steam itself. And it's kind of a layer between virtual reality devices and software. So you have your VR headset, in my case, Oculus Rift, you run Steam VR, that provides an interface, and then the games and sims plug into Steam VR and power this headset. Now we have that, and it's it's actually pretty cool. It means that we're starting to get a lot more titles supporting this, which is kind of cool. The other big thing, though, that 0 0.8 and I guess 1.0 bring with them is that you could go through various hacks in the past to get a, a, a view of what the person wearing the headset is seeing on a monitor. You could actually do all sorts of weird tricks and gubbins is and you could see these two images on your monitor screen, the left eye and the right eye, they would be superimposed or not the superimposed, they would be placed next to each other and you could see what the player sees. With 0 0.8 that's all changed and now your software, your Oculus Rift and, and your game and your sim or whatever else are rendering three images at a time per frame. They're rendering a left eye image, a right eye image and a composite image and that composite image is put onto your main monitor. So you can be in your flight sim flying around and anybody can come in the room and look at the monitor and see a pretty standard picture of, of what a flight sim looks like. They're not going to see these two separate disparate images. It's kind of cool. In, in fact, it's cool to the point that we could, as YouTubers now, start uh, recording uh, games in Oculus Rift without showing you something that looks completely awful, which is two oblong, two, two oval screens next to each other. Um, this does pose some problems, though. Let's talk about title support before I, again, launch into a demo. Um, the titles are, for us simulation people, are kind of limited. Now, I know there is Fly Inside. Fly Inside is an add-on for FSX and Prepared, which makes those titles support the Oculus Rift, but it uses extended mode. You would need to change how those sims actually render stuff to use direct mode. So I don't expect to see an update on Fly Inside supporting the release version of Oculus Rift, to be honest. Uh, there was another similar one whose name I can't remember, which was just prepared. And again, it would basically uh, let prepared work with an Oculus Rift headset in extended mode, so where it's being treated as its own monitor. And it was kind of cool. The problem is, Many people have mentioned you can get sick with this. You get motion sickness. And the reason you get motion sickness is your eyes are not relaying what your brain expects. This is why some people get motion sick in a car or on a boat. You, know, you feel that motion in your body. Your eyes aren't really relaying. We're moving too much. And you start to feel a little bit sick. It's way more than that. I'm sure there's inner ear stuff going on as well. In a game, in a flight sim, you find that if you move your head like this and it takes even a tiniest fraction of a second for that image to catch up as you turn your head within a minute, two minutes, you start to feel very, very nauseous. The sweet spot for virtual reality is apparently 75 frames per second. If you can get the virtual environment you're in to output to the headset at 75 frames per second, you're golden. And for, there, is, there are other stuff to fly into it as well. If you have a constant frame of reference, for example, if you're on a roller coaster or a first person shooter, you have no constant frame of reference. You are a camera bobbing around an environment. There's no nothing constant there for your brain to relate to. If you're driving a racing sim, however, or flying an aircraft or flying a spaceship, you have a cockpit. You have a cockpit frame around you, which is a constant frame of reference. So a very smooth frame rate of 75 frames per second plus a constant frame of reference like a cockpit or the, in, the cabin of a truck or the interior of a car mitigates that motion sickness quite a lot. You still might get some initially. You can train it out. You do five minutes, 10 minutes at a time, take 30 minute break and try another five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minute break. And you'll find within a day or so, it, motion sickness is not an issue at all. But bear that in mind. You need to bear that in mind because 
the requirements to run a VR headset, even one as low resolution as this one, are significant. You need a, a, a PC capable of rendering a high quality image three separate times per frame, left eye, right eye, and preview now. And that, that that's quite a hefty PC. It really is quite a chunky PC. Mine can manage it. I have a Devil's Canyon 4790K with a GeForce GTX 980, not a TI, and it does get away with it. Sometimes I need to lower the quality levels, the graphic levels in the environment that I'm in, be it uh, Egonomics DCS World or Elite Dangerous or something like that. So the reason I'm bringing all this up as well is you all know FSX and Prepared getting 75 frames per second is a no-no. It's just very, very, very next to impossible with a bunch of add-ons. If you load a complex aircraft in like the PMDG 737 or 777, you're not going to hit 75 frames per second, particularly if you're flying into complex scenery. I don't have much hope, I'm afraid, for FSX and Prepared in the future of virtual reality. The sim that has got it right so far is DCS World. DCS World 1.5 and DCS World 2 both support direct mode output. They can both manage 75 frames per second. You will need to turn the graphics down on many PCs. It's not a big deal though because the image you're looking at, while fairly high resolution, is very, very small. So if you're removing some visual artifacts like blades of grass or something like that, you're not going to notice it. You're really not. It does doesn't matter. The showcase title for Oculus Rift and VR on a PC right now is Elite Dangerous. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to cut this right here. And when I come back, I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo of what this is like somehow. I'm going to run the camera and show you the preview, I guess. What this is like in Elite Dangerous and why it is not anything like running three monitors side by side. Once I've done that, I will try very hard to get DCS World working as well. It's not released yet. It's still very much beta. It is a bit uh, touch and go in places, but uh, wish me luck and I'll see you in a minute. All right, so here we are in Elite Dangerous and you'll notice that I'm looking around and if you look at the game itself, wherever I look, the view proportionally changes. It's not like Track IR where a small movement makes a, a large update to the screen. So in a dogfight, I really will be looking directly up, for example. If I did need to cold and, cold and dark start an aircraft, I can look straight down. There's my legs and my stunning body. Um, and I can click on buttons and everything else. Now, that brings up an important point, clicking on buttons. I can't see anything right now other than Elite Dangerous. And in fact, it gets worse. I have here my handy headphones. If I put these on, it is now completely immersive. I can't hear anything outside of the game environment. All I can see is the game environment. I am, to all intents and purposes, in a spaceship. I really am. I can't... There's nothing that would break the immersion here. I understand with the HTC Vive, there is a, a gap at the bottom that lets you see a lot more than I can here. There is a very tiny gap right about here. And if I wanted to reach out to my keyboard, I could look up, move my hand, and I can see my hand on my keys now, and I can press a key. It's not ideal, but it does work. But by and large... For interacting with controls, you need to know where they are. So I need to know that my mouse is directly in front of me and I'm using a Cytec X55 HOTAS. That is essential, a HOTAS of some kind. Now you notice the screen kind of went funky there and I have a black bar on the right. That's because I recentered off center. Now I'm looking center, now it's good. And I shouldn't need to recenter again unless I do something crazy to move around. Let's go flying and I'll give you some idea of what this is like. I've got to lock my chair or I'm going to start spinning all over the office. So. Powering up again, headphones are on, it's very loud, which you kind of need, and I'm completely immersed, and I can look up and I can see these ice asteroids, and I can fly around this one because I'm looking right at it, and it's crazy. The first time you do this is a little bit nauseating. In fact, it's very nauseating. <laughs> it's even worse in a flight sim like DCS World if you've never done it before because you're suddenly experiencing things that you have never most of us experienced before, like high G turns, diving towards the ground at Mach 1, Mach 2, not Mach 2, but you get the idea, and so on. But, by and large, this is great. It's low resolution because it's DK2, and I understand from early adopters I've spoken to who have the release version that the resolution is dramatically improved to the point that it's just perfect. I hope that's the case. I can't really vouch for it. There are some things in here that I need to shoot. I don't know what my targeting buttons are. That's not it. 
Nope. I have no idea what I'm targeting with. Great. But I can see them up there, so let's go ahead and see if we can lock this. I can. I'm going to take some pot shots at it. And that was crazy. But that, that flew right through my face. But anyway, I wanted to show you the big differentiator between this and Track IR. First of all, in Track IR, if I lean forward, it zooms the screen. If I lean forward with Oculus Rift, I am physically moving closer, and I can almost reach out and touch it. This here, that's the comms panel that I'm looking at top right. It's a true 3D environment. I can lean around the joystick. By the way, the joysticks in uh, Elite Dangerous in Oculus Rift are actually the X52, which is kind of cool. But I can lean around objects and get a different perspective which is freaky. The other thing with Track IR is you're limited in just how much you can move. So I couldn't ever look straight up like that without causing a problem. More to the point, with Track IR on, I could never do this. Notice I'm now looking directly backwards. In fact, it gets even crazier than that. Now, I've got to be very careful I don't fall over and break my neck, but the, the positional tracking on a virtual reality headset like Vive HTC or HTC Vive or Oculus Rift is mind-blowing. Check this out. Now I'm going to try not to break my neck. Okay, I've now stood up. Look, I stepped away. I'm still in a spaceship. Notice that outline on the floor. That's called chaperone mode in Steam VR. It's showing me where my chair is. So at any point in time I can get back to my chair, I can see where it is. But if I step behind here, look, I am exploring a virtual reality environment in my home, in my office. I can look at the back of the chair here and it's three-dimensional. I can see the door that would lead to the back of the ship. I can look up, I can look back over my spaceship. It is absolutely sublime. Now this is the bit where you're all laughing because I can't see damn thing. Hang on, I can't find my chair. <laughs> all right, there's one arm, there's the other arm. So I can grab my chair, sit down. I do need to recenter at this point. So I'm gonna get back into position, put my feet on the pedals. I now know Based on how my feet feel, I'm centered so I can recenter. And off we go. Sorry, I've got an itch. If you get itches, you're screwed. <laughs> With Oculus Rift as well, because it is so imposing here, don't even think about drinking. So if you want to get a glass of water or milk or a cup of coffee, it's a nightmare. It really is a nightmare. Um, I strongly advise a, a large supply of very long straws. Let's go flying around. Now, I've not used this for quite a while. It was only today, in fact, that I managed to get 0.8, which is almost the release version of the software working with Elite Dangerous. So it is having an effect on my head right now. Even though my frame rate is absolutely fantastic, it's still quite disorienting to be seeing the things I'm seeing. And as I see them, as I see this ship pulling like this, my eyes are telling my brain I should be feeling something, and it's not. So I'm starting to feel a little bit odd. Not sick, just odd. The other cool thing with this as well, if I boost, get some serious speed going here, you really do get a sense of speed passing objects using a virtual reality headset. It's pretty crazy. Whoa, I saw a shadow of my ship on that as we passed it. It's insane. But in a dogfight, it is so cool because you have that freedom of looking anywhere. You have a lot more situational awareness than another pilot. I just press the silent running button, let's turn it back on. Anyway, let me see if I can get DCS World working. I'm going to take a little jaunt around Vegas briefly. Wow. Okay, so this is DCS World 2.0 with the Nevada map. I have turned the graphics down, but even so, in Rift, the frame rate's still a little bit off. Not a big deal. Beta hardware with alpha software. Some uh, concessions have to be made. And I've already forgotten what the key is to center the view. No, I'm having no joy centering the view. Hopefully this is okay. So I'm going to unpause this. This, because it is a proper sim now, in a helicopter, is going to be, for me, extremely disorienting. I don't do this very much in DCS World, because, frankly, I'm a bit of a wuss. Um, but we'll try it. 
Oh, no we won't. What's going on here? Okay, pause, break. Okay. So instantly I'm in the cockpit. I'm making sure my collective works, which it does. It is very disorienting. The cockpit is very small. It's an attack helicopter. It's cramped. It's not pleasant. I did need to center my view and I haven't. Let's see if I can do that once more. No, no joy at all. So we're just going to have to fly with this view. I should be a little bit lower down so I can see the HUD. But you'll get the idea. I've forgotten what the recenter key is. Don't leave me a comment. I can look it up after this video. But instantly, because I have ground nearby, it's having a dramatic effect on me physically. I can feel my heart rate increasing. I'm tense. I'm anxious. My body is not supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. And in general, the consequences of my actions now feel a lot more real. And it is awesome. Absolutely awesome. Let's try and do a fairly tight combat turn. Looking up now, trying to get a good view of where I am. There's the tower I want to head towards. Oh, and as we come out, I had slip, sideways slip to the right, and I really felt it. <laughs> and I'm probably shouting, I should stop shouting, but I really felt that. Um, because it's virtual reality, because I am in this environment, and this is all I can see and all I can hear, ooh, <laughs> the effects are absolutely mind-blowing. Similarly, I'm drifting a little bit now, and it's very easy to spot that and compensate for that because I have so many frames of reference now. My peripheral vision is doing what it should do. My peripheral vision is behaving as it would for a helicopter pilot. I'm really taking in the fact that I was moving sideways over landscape where I would not on a monitor. 110 degrees field of view, I think. Let's see if we can just fly around this tower. I'm not going to... Well, actually, I might climb up. It would probably be a lot safer for me to climb up. In fact, let's give you guys a laugh. I'm going to climb up. Now, because it's a DK2, it's a little bit hard to read these instruments. Not crazy hard, not impossible, just a little bit hard. So we've got quite a lot of height. I'm going to keep on climbing. VVI is showing quite a rate of climb right now. And just to really make it hard on me now, I'm going to bring back the nose. We're slowing down, looking at my speed down there. Entering a hover there. And I'm going to dump the collective nose over. Oh my god! <laughs> uh, oh. And try to pull out. No, I didn't make it. I'm not going to do it again. You get the idea, I hope. Absolutely incredible. Anyway, let's go to conclusions before I puke. <laughs> oh, wow. All right, the conclusions. <laughs> the promise of virtual reality has always been that it would transport you into a virtual reality, a different world. And i got to be honest with you, it does. It does. I've been using this for months. I tend to stay away from flight scenes with it because of what you just saw. It's just crazy. It's absolutely crazy, but I enjoy the space sims with it a lot. Um... I believe that virtual reality is the future of simulation. I truly do. The ability to put a trainee pilot in a virtual cockpit and have them immersed in that cockpit and able to look around and hopefully in future with things, things like the, the leap motion controllers and, and uh, other tools like that interact with that 3D cockpit is mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. And it is those things that contributed to me the day that uh, the pre-orders became available. I was on the website refreshing it, refreshing it, refreshing it until the pre-order came out and I bought it instantly. Not instantly, I had some problems buying it. Uh, they had some crashes and bugs from the traffic hitting the website, but I bought it as soon as I could. And my unit ships, I think, in May. But I had no hesitation doing that because the release version of this is supposed to be better, lighter, uh, faster, smoother, higher resolution, just all round better. It's the commercial customer version of this and uh, I'm very excited to see what it brings. The, to answer the question I had from Lewis on Twitter and a few other people have said it as well, this is nothing like having three monitors on your desk. <laughs> to get the same feeling, wow, I've just got a wave of dizziness. To get the same feeling 
from monitors that you would get from this, you would need to have monitors all around you, above you, beside you, everywhere you look, there would need to be monitors. And even then, it wouldn't be a virtual reality experience. In this, if I lean into an object in the cockpit, as you saw, I lean into that object. If I lean into my monitor, all that happens is the monitor gets closer to my face and the picture gets bigger. It's not really leaning into a 3D object. Similarly, think about, um, a Cessna, for example, where you have switches underneath the yoke. And so typically in flight simulation, what I'll do recording a video is I'll turn the yoke off so I can get to those switches. Well, with a virtual reality headset, I'm just going to lean down so I can see those switches and interact with them just as I would in a real aircraft. And that's also important as well for training pilots, developing a spatial awareness of where in the cockpit various things are is very important and very, very useful. I do also look forward to the future of flight simulation because of something like this because you need 75 frames per second to stave off nausea for example that means developers of the next generation of flight simulation are going to have to step up and uh, go beyond what we already have particularly in terms of frame rates and particularly in terms of visual fidelity uh, we're there i think on the visual fidelity companies like a2a um real uh my, my mind has gone real air simulations, PMDG, uh, produce stunning visual models, which do look actually quite good in VR, but the frame rate of the sim kills it. And the fact that uh, when this releases, sims and games will need to talk to it via direct mode also puts a damper on people who are producing plugins to the sims, which make it work with virtual reality. I'm interested to hear your thoughts, what you think. It, it is very expensive. It is not a... a purchase on a whim decision for many many people but i gotta tell you if you can put up with a limited number of titles that are going to be available for us simmers at release it's primarily driving sims racing sims space sims and one very good flight sim that being dcs world if you can put up with that uh, limited choice and i think you're going to be quite happy but everybody that's entrenched in dc in fsx sorry or in prepared or in x-plane you're probably going to have to Maybe hang on to that wallet a little bit longer and see what those camps do, particularly Dovetail with their new sim that comes out later this year. As always, my name is Frugal. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to go lie down. I'll see you all very soon.